kind of humbling coming after Andy and Senator and uh, Representative McDermott. Um, and after that introduction, it's like, who is this person? It's uh, OK. Um, also, you know, I've, I have a bunch of apologies to start out with because I'm one of those old white guys with a PowerPoint. And so, yeah. I, so, um, and, and I'm an economist, which is, to be sure, is even worse. So maybe we'll back up a second for that one. Um, I, I, I will, if you are nice, and if we have time, I'll show you a picture of my dog. And that's kind of the main. You know, uh, he comes to my class. I teach this mega lecture of you know, 500, 800 students, and the dog comes, and the students regularly ride on that course evaluations. Uh, professor was kind of OK, but the dog was good. The dog was good, so OK. So we're going to talk about health care. Um, and I'll continue with the uh, apologies for being an economist, um, because uh, I did, you know, <laughs> for being a professor, because professors focus on narrow points of differences, the narcissism of little differences. So um, it was a very nice introduction. But you know, the healthcare system we have, it didn't just grow like topsy. I mean, there was a deliberate design. And it shows up even in this graph that I have here. Um, when the economists started getting involved in healthcare, that's when everything started to really get bad. You know, um, and I'm, I'm getting older. One of the nice things about getting older is you can remember the history. I, it's not just something in books. I remember in the 70s when economists started talking about we have a problem of health care, and the problem of health care is people get their health care for free. Uh, they have insurance, so they're not paying the cost of the health care. And if we want to control costs in health care, uh, we need to start having cost sharing. And nowadays, they don't call it cost sharing anymore. They call it consumer-directed, consumer-driven health care. But it's all the same thing. It's all about getting people to pay the cost of their health care, do away with insurance, so that people will stop using so much health care. Or, to quote many economists that I've had these conversations with, abusing health care. That's what they think goes on. People abuse health care because they're not paying the cost of it. And this is where economists started getting involved in health care. The red line here uh, is the index of healthcare spending in the United States. The blue line is the income out of which we pay for health care. These are indexes, so you don't have to worry that the red line's higher than the, the blue line. It's not that we've run out of money yet, but that's going to happen if we keep going this way. Um, and you know, one apology I need to make is economists aren't funny. Economists mostly tell you what you can't do. Um, and I used to also be the treasurer of the local synagogue. Um, and treasurers tell you what you can't do. Treasurers maybe have better reason than economists. Um, but the economists will go around telling you, you can't do this, you can't do that. Because after all, if you could have done it, if it was doable, you would have done it already. Somebody would have done it already. Yeah. Um, so when uh, people talk to Andy about, oh, you can't do this, you, you know, it's disempowering. The whole purpose of the economics profession is to show you, is to disempower you. To show you that, you know, you just, just go lie down. Um, but economists did get involved. They got involved and they started in these healthcare innovations, promoting cost sharing, co-payments, higher deductibles, and everything started getting worse and worse until we're at the point where the Congressional Budget Office, if you look at their long-term budget outlook, which I bet none of you have done because it's you know, like LTBO spreadsheet. And it says how we're going to, the deficit's going to become so gigantic. It's scary. You know, it's under the bed. So you can't go to sleep yet. You know, you, you, know, you have to look in the closet. Oh, a big green monster deficit. It's like, oh, God, I hate economists. Um, anyway, the LTBO projects 70 years of what's going to happen to the U.S. economy. Well, guess what? In 50 years, health care will be 100% of the U.S. economy. You know, I said economists aren't funny. I lied because they have another 20 years on their projections. I, I really want to ask somebody about that. You know, what do you think is going to happen? Okay. Anyway, so here's, okay, this isn't a joke. I mean, it's like we really, we really, you know, we're really bad at health care in this country. We've got great doctors. We've got wonderful hospitals. We innovate. We have, you know, 
the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, finance all this great drug research. We do all that stuff. The VA is pretty good, but the rest of us stinks. Um, here we have health expenditures. Okay, this is 2004. Someday I've got to update this graph. I mean, you could do it 2010 now, but I'm lazy. Um, so here we go. We've got every country, health expenditures, female life expectancy. Yeah, you could do this for men also, same thing. Um, Spain's pretty good. They, they live to be like 84, and they only spend $2,000 on health care per person. Uh, Portugal's a poor country, but yeah, they're, they're not too bad. They, they live to 81, and they're spending about you know, $1,500 per person on health care. Here's your, us. $6,000 spending on health care per person. Nobody comes close. I mean, okay, Luxembourg comes close, but Luxembourg's cheating because it's like this, this big. You know, and they've got all these banks where you know, the Europeans put their money that they don't want to pay taxes on. Um, but okay, here's the line, the average relationship between healthcare uh, spending and life expectancy. Spend more, live longer. Healthcare works. Live longer, you spend more because you're old. Okay. Either way, you've got a positive association. Here's us. We are four years below what we should be getting in life expectancy for our spending. You know, that's how you, know, you doctors would think of it. We should have four more years of life expectancy. Economists, we're spending $4,500 too much for our life expectancy. We should get the money back. OK. Yeah. Yeah, either way, we're bad at this. Um, and it's getting worse. I mean, this is just incredible. You think about it. I did some work for the Vermont State Employees Association a couple weeks ago. Vermont State College um, workers. Average median income for people in that bargaining unit, $30,000. They've got people you know, with the health plan so that come to over $20,000, family health plan. That's getting to be typical in this country. Here we have, back in 1960, long before the economists even knew about health care. You know, economists back then were just doing deficit spending. Um, seven, a ha average health insurance premiums for a family came to 7% of the average family wage and salary income in this country. When I say average, I'm doing medians. Um, it, because of rising inequality that Andy talked about. There's going to be a big difference between median and mean. But median's the better number because half the people below, half the people above. Okay, 7%. Okay, so you paid your health insurance and then you, you, know, you paid your groceries and you bought a bike for your kid. It's all about the stuff. Yeah. Okay, 1970, it was worse, but not all that bad. You know, Nixon was president. May 4th, uh, 1970, you get extra credit if you remember what happened that day. Um, and 11%. Uh, Thank you, Kent State. Yes, two points. Okay. Uh, 1980, it was up to 17%. But oh, you know, we were getting worried. You know, it's like, oh, this is really bad. So we need to have more co-pays, more deductibles. We need to control healthcare costs by getting consumers to be more responsible and doctors to stop doing so much. That's what people were saying. 26% 1990. Leveled off because the economy actually grew in the 90s. You know, I mean, jaw, people actually got raises under Clinton, you know, when Clinton was president. Uh, but now we're up to 39%. And it's just going up. Yeah. Um, the ACA, you know, I, I showed up the other day, yesterday, yesterday, wearing my Obama shirt. You know, I, I love the man, I admit it. Um, and half my friends have jobs in the administration and Council of Economic Advisors, whatever. You know, it's like, um, you know, it's, I had dinner with this, such and such. It's like, you know, academics were all very inflated in our self esteem. But that said, and, I, and there's a lot that I like in the law, or at least some things I like in the law. Um, the thing I like most about it is it makes promises it can't realize. So in a couple of years, we're going to have an opportunity to really do something. You know, the congressman stole my quote, the Churchill quote. But, uh, okay. Right now, I can tell you, you know, our wonderful uh, award recipient, notwithstanding, talking to legislators about health care reform 
a single payer reform is kind of like a hopeless proposition. Um, they tell you, we're busy. We have to set up exchanges. Um, the Republicans say, go to hell. The Democrats say, well, no, they're, they're, the Republicans don't say that because you can't even get in the doors. Um, but the Democrats tell you, we love you. Of course you're right, but we can't do anything about it. We passed this law. We've got to you know, carry this law out. We've got to fix the, we've got to set up the exchanges. We're too busy. We can't even think about it. Um, part of them are thinking is that, God damn it, every time we do health care as Democrats, we get killed in the next election. Um, but that said, nothing's going to happen for a couple of years. They're going to give the exchanges a chance. They're going to try this thing, and then it's going to fail because it can't succeed. The White House doesn't even say it will succeed. It promises universal coverage. It commits, no, no it doesn't promise universal coverage. It commits the United States to universal coverage, but the White House admits it will not cover everybody. There'll be 20 million people left out. And what's worse, the uninsured are going to go up by the White House projections. I'm not making this up. This is what the White House says. The number of uninsured will rise starting after 2017. And the White House says, oh, we're going to save $800 billion. We're going to bend the cost curve. Well. I could go into their $800 billion number, it's inflated, but that's notwithstanding. Let's give them the $800 billion. It still doesn't amount to anything. 2% of healthcare spending. It's going to slow the rate of growth by 0.2% per annum if it succeeds in that. You know, I mean, okay, so you go to the White House and say, oh, well, you know, it's not going to help. And they're gonna, what are they going to say? Oh, we underestimated the savings? We underestimated the number of people who will be covered? No, it's not going to work. And in 10 years, when this number is not 39%, but is 48%, 50%, when that happens, we have to be ready because the other side is going to have a plan. And they are ready. We have to be ready with an effective plan, with a single payer plan that's going to cut administrative waste um, and expand services because they are going to come up with a plan that's going to cut services. And that's what we're already seeing in Massachusetts. Um, I love Massachusetts. My siblings, you know, all live in New York and they say like, are you still living up there? Like, when are you coming back? Yeah. And my students are like, how can you be a Yankee fan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. But I live in the state that created this country because we had a rebellion against a bad government. And we created the campaign to end slavery because we thought that it was wrong for people to be exploiting people like that. Um, so how did we get Romney care? Well, we got it because we were running a referendum um, in 2004, a referendum to establish health care as a human right in the Constitution, a constitutional amendment, and we were winning. We were ahead in the polls. So two things happened. The insurance industry dumped five, seven, ten million. I, I don't know. Somebody might know how much money they dumped in advertising. And that hurt our poll numbers. And the Democratic leadership in the legislature, which I'm not going to say they were in the pocket of the insurance industry and in the hospitals. I don't know what, what they were thinking. But they said, oh, no, we don't need the constitutional amendment. We will get universal coverage without health care is a human right. We'll come up with another plan. We don't need a single payer plan. We'll do it without that. Romney care. They worked a deal with the Republican governor and they worked it out. And I was like, well, I want everybody to be covered. I want more coverage. I want people to get better, you know, but this? Well, of course, Romney care, the model for the ACA, has extended coverage. It's done better than anybody any of the projections for the ACA. Um, we have higher coverage in Massachusetts. We started with a lot higher coverage. It has done nothing to control costs. Um, and costs are rising, and state spending on health care is exploding, cutting into the money available for higher education, which is down 50%, um, cutting into the money for local aid for K-12 schooling, which is down 75%. Every line in the state budget is being cut over the last six or seven years, except for health care, because all the state resources are being 
go in that direction, to feed the beast of uncontrolled course. And the legislature, the legislators hate this. You know, they hate having to tell their constituents, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that because we're funding health care. And nobody wants to cut dental services for children, which they did cut three years ago, um, though they restored some of it last year. Yeah. Nobody wants to cut services, so they're like, okay, what are we going to do? So they came up with consumer-driven health care. Last summer, the Massachusetts legislature passed cost containment. And David Cutler, you know, Harvard economist, that, I mean, I like David, but, you know, I, he actually says it's going to save all this money. And it's like, you've got to be kidding me. You know, I tried to get him to itemize. You know, wait, wait, I mean, he said, I'll, I'll, he said, I'll send you an email. <laughs> Seriously? He said, I'll send it to you in an email. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, never got it. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, yes, I checked my spam filter, you know. Okay, anyway, consumer-driven healthcare where people will pay for quality. So, you know, that will give everybody incentive to provide quality. Um, shared risk so that the doctors will be taking on some of the risk of overspending so they won't overprescribe. Key items. There are two key items. Items. I mean, there's a lot of flim flam and a lot of promises in the bill, but the two key items are everybody's supposed to get, doctors are all supposed to get into afford, accountable care organizations. My old teaching colleague, I used to teach with Zeke Emanuel, we taught a seminar on social theory. Um, Zeke really believes in this stuff. Um, okay, put all the doctors into affordable care organizations, capitate their payments. They promised risk adjustment. I mean, I, I, I was sitting there talking to the head of the Assembly Committee on Health Care, he said, we will have such risk adjustment that doctors will really want to get the sick people into their practices. There's no risk adjustment in the capitation plan in the law. He just lied to me. Um, but, okay, even if there was risk adjustment, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, it, I don't, I've never seen anybody explain how it could actually work. Physician tiering. You go to a doctor who has a past history of prescribing lots of medicine and sending people to specialists, that doctor goes into tier three and you pay extra. Your copay goes up for that doctor. Go to a doctor who tells everybody to take two aspirins, pats you on the head, and sends you away and you, so you drop dead outside his door. That doctor, only 10 bucks for your copay. So everybody wants to go to which doctor? I don't know. Rather than consumer-driven health care, we should talk about patient-centered medical barriers. That's what they want to put up. They want to turn the doctors into insurance companies. It's bad enough we have to deal with the insurance companies where maybe the doctor's our ally. I'm talking as a patient. You guys are all doctors, so, you know. But at least we want you on, on our side. No, no. They want to make the doctors the insurance company so the doctors will try to avoid the sick people. Moments of madness. How do you get change? Yeah. You don't get change incrementally. I mean, I, you know, um, I, Paul Starr used to be at Harvard, and you know, we talked, and he's a big believer in incremental change. You get a little bit, you go a little bit, you go a little bit further. And it, you know, the Social Security developed better. But the point, do you want to look at the improvements, the slow improvements in Social Security in the 40s and 50s? Or do you want to talk about how we got Social Security in the first place? We, as Andy says, we can't cross the chasm in two steps. To make the change we need, we need the big leap. And those big leaps happen only occasionally, a few times in history. Have we had the type of mass movement that forces the powers that be to make a giant change? These are called moments of madness. This, after an article by Aristide Zolberg, who used to teach at Columbia, um, and was in Paris in May, June, 68. Uh, we have to be ready when that moment comes. I think in five years, seven years, 10 years, We'll have the choice in this country between a popular movement demanding decent health care and the elites, the insurance companies, their politicians in their pockets, who will be, and the drug companies, who will be saying, oh, well, we need to control costs by squeezing the people even more. 
And at that moment, there'll be a popular movement, and it will be looking for leadership. It will be looking for a program. In the 30s, there were institutional economists, there were people on the left who had a program. And when the public was looking for it, they grabbed that program, they were there. We need to be there in five years. We need to have a program. We need to have a grassroots base, people around to talk about it to their neighbors. That's the type of movement that might be able to overcome you know, the great force of insurance and capital, just as the abolitionists in the 19th, in the 19th century were. When the moment came, they were there, ready to lead the country in overthrowing slavery. Um, that's the lesson from Massachusetts. There are a couple lessons there. So thank you all very much for having me. It's